thank you all for being here today for the first session of the Women's Summit series for this year entitled Women Lawyers Serving on Corporate Boards, Value Proposition and Board Search Strategies. Uh, this session will, is being recorded and will be available as part of the law school CLE library. So you will be able to access it after today. Um, my name is Laura Tepper. I'm the executive director of development at the law school. And it is my pleasure today to introduce our moderator, Helen Pudlin, uh, class of 74 from the law school. She is a trustee at the Penn Mutual Insurance Company, chair of the board of trustees at the Wistar Institute and former executive vice president and general counsel at the PNC Financial Services Group. And she will be leading the group today. I will turn it over to her and I encourage everyone to um, answer these poll questions during our introduction. <clears throat> Take it away, <throat> Helen. <laughs> Get poll Thanks, Laura. Welcome everyone. I hope you're all staying healthy and safe during these really difficult times. In this period of tremendous disruption, it's a good time to pause to look ahead and consider rounding out your careers and your next chapter through board service. We have a wonderful group of accomplished panelists today who all serve on boards and are ardent, proponent, ardent pro, pro, proponents of and promoters of diversity in the boardroom. I'm going to ask each of them to give a brief description of themselves. And let me start with Sharice. Caroline, I'm really glad to be here uh, today. Um, I am um, a, uh, a retiree from Comcast Corporation, uh, former partner at Valix Bar, and I currently serve on um, several boards. Um, I serve on the Penn Mutual Life Insurance Board since 2006, uh, Pico, an Exelon company since 2010, uh, and Independence Health Group Incorporated, the parent company of Independence Blue Cross and uh, AmeriHealth Caritas since 2018. Um, I also serve on two uh, advisory boards, the PNC Regional Advisory Board for Southeastern Pennsylvania, Delaware, and Southern New Jersey, and uh, Connect IQ, IQ uh, since uh, 2020, 2020. Um, that's it. Great, Charisse. Rhonda? Hi, everybody. Um, I am a graduate of Penn Law School and practiced law at Ballard Spar from graduation until my retirement. Um, early in my career, I began sitting on a number of small nonprofit boards, later moved on to larger nonprofits and eventually to for-profit boards. Um, currently, I serve as chair of the board of the Glen Mead Trust Company. Thanks, Rhonda. Gail? And most importantly, I'm a graduate of the law school with Helen. Not only were we in the same class, but we sat in the same row. Um, and uh, I started my career at Morgan Lewis and Bacchius in Philadelphia, and uh, then became a serial general counsel. My last uh, general counsel position was at Harley Davidson in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, and I'm now at Denton's law firm. Uh, so I've sort of gone full circle from law firm to general counsel back to law firm. Uh, for purposes of today on um, boards, um, I've sat on four boards, two public, two private. Um, we sold two, I'm still on two boards. Um, one's public company, Badger Meter, in the water meter and industrial flow business in Milwaukee. And the other is Sargento Foods. Uh, been on that since 2006. I hope you all buy our products. Cheese, of course, from Wisconsin. Um, I'm also on my undergraduate university board, uh, which is actually larger than both of those two companies put together, um, which is uh, some from a nonprofit standpoint is a significant operation. And I'm on a number of other nonprofit boards, one in the veteran space. Um, since Harley Davidson is very aligned with veterans, I got involved in that area and I'm on one in, in Washington um, and the International Senior Lawyers Project and still on the board of the Milwaukee Art Museum. And if you wanna know whether Gail rides a motorcycle, the answer is yes, right, Gail? Yes, still. <laughs> Howard. I'm Howard Brownstein. Um, I went to Penn as an undergraduate. I went to law and business school at some place you never heard of up in Boston. Um, my day job is heading a firm that does turnaround and crisis management. So I don't practice law. 
Uh, but for more than 40 years, I've been serving as an independent corporate <laughs> board member, several public companies, several large uh, private companies, uh, some large nonprofits. Uh, right now, I serve on the uh, uh, on the board of PNF Industries, a microcap public company, and on the board of Meriki, a very large nonprofit with more than 10,000 employees. Uh, very active in the National Association of Corporate Directors. I uh, served as president of the chapter here in Philadelphia, and I'm a board leadership fellow at NACD and part of its national faculty. Great. Uh, looking at the polling responses, we have a real broad, broad population of people at different levels of their career and different backgrounds. So with that in mind, uh, it will help inform our discussion. Uh, today we'll focus on how you leverage your network to get on a board, <laughs> what to consider before joining a board, and how to frame your value proposition among other topics. In the last few years, there's been an increased awareness of the value of women on corporate boards and an increase in the number of women on corporate boards. Research by several organizations shows that companies with women board members, especially three or more women, financially outperform on average those with fewer or no women board members. This increase in the number of women on boards results from several factors, including pressure by investment firms, investors, proxy advisory firms, other stakeholders, and legislatures. For example, California required its public health, publicly held companies headquartered there to have at least one woman on their board by the end of 2019. <laughs> The required number by the end of 2021 goes up to at least two women for corporations with five directors and three women for corporations with six or more directors. And there are other states considering similar laws. To give you a few statistics, women now hold 22.6% of the board seats of Russell 3000 companies. Those are all public companies. In 2019, 27% of the Fortune 5 100 companies, again, public companies, were held by women. And according to a Hydric and Struggles 2019 board annual report, and this is actually significant, out of the 462 Fortune 500 board seats filled in 2018, 183 seats went to women. That's almost 40%. There's also been a significant increase in the last few years in the number of women on boards in middle market and global companies. We haven't achieved parity, but there's significant progress for women on boards. The progress, progress for people of color, however, is not as good, but racial and ethnic diversity on boards is now a heightened focus, and there are several initiatives <laughs> underway. Again, California takes the lead on the legislative front in this country. California has passed a law requiring each covered corporation to have at least one director from an underrepresented community on its board by the end of 2021. And the number goes up by the end of 2022, depending on the size of the board for companies with five or more directors. So with that introduction, let me turn to our panelists. Therese, would you tell us how you secured your first corporate board position and the next for-profit board position? and describe the role of your personal and professional relationships in getting a board seat. Yes, um, thank you, Helen. Um, the first uh, corporate board that I joined was Penn Mutual Life Insurance uh, Board. Um, that board I had, I, I had I joined in 2006 after I had joined uh, Comcast. And, it, and it's interesting that we're talking to lawyers about opportunities and there was no interest in my joining that board until I, I went to Comcast. And so I think part of it was the uh, was Comcast, but also the fact that I, I was now um, considered a business person as opposed to a lawyer. And I think that that's something that we'll probably talk about today. But that board, and this really talks about the importance of personal relationships. On that board, the president of Penn Mutual had been a board member with me when I served on the Federal Reserve uh, Bank uh, Board of Philadelphia from 1996 to 2002. And it's about also maintaining relationships. So I had relationships with several uh, board members uh, of the uh, yeah, Philadelphia Fed and three of those board members also served on the Penn Mutual Board uh, uh, of, of Directors. 
And so they immediately called me. And shortly after I, I joined Comcast and, and said, you know, we really are very interested in having you join the board. So, you know, I think the lesson, and then the, the, the next board that, uh, that I joined um, was Pico, an excellent company. Once again, through relationships, I knew the CEO um, and, the, and I knew every board member. Every board member, I had either served on a nonprofit board uh, with um, uh, mm -hmm. one person I had been in Chip Philadelphia 25 years before. Um, and um, I, I'll say to everybody who's, who's listening to my voice, I have friends from first grade. And so I, this is not something, I, I don't make friends and keep friends because I'm trying to get on a board or do anything else. It's who I am. But if that's not who you are, then you can begin the process, particularly for those of you that are young in your career, to stay in touch with the people um, with whom you come in contact in both your business and uh, professional uh, dealings, because you never know when those paths are going to cross again. Um, the, uh, with the next board with Pico, once again, I knew the CEO, um, uh, independent sales group rather, um, I knew the CEO and the previous CEO and the previous CEO. And um, they um, had, had approached me and I was really not in a position to join um, initially because um, I was overboarded. And we'll also talk about that, you know, how many corporate boards should you really serve on? Um, but in each of these instances, uh, a combination of my hard work, um, having a reputation in the community, uh, and then having those personal relationships. And so you, it's never gonna be too early in your career for you to start thinking about how am I going to maintain friendships and, um, uh, you know, a presence in the minds of uh, the uh, business and, and professional relationships you have? If you ever have the privilege of walking down with down the street with Sharice, you know, <laughs> you can't get down the street for about a half hour because she knows about 30 people passing you. Uh, anyway, Rhonda, thanks, Sharice. Thank you. So there is no single way to secure your first corporate board position, but my story is going to reinforce a lot of what Sharice just said about the importance of relationships. Um, so my corporate board service grew out of my service on nonprofit boards and also a bit of uh, serendipity, I think. Um, I was appointed to the board of Community College of Philadelphia in 1992 and eventually became chair of that board. As chair, I sat ex officio on the board of its fundraising arm, the Community College Foundation. One of the board members of that foundation board was the CEO of Glenmead Trust Company. So I wasn't out to get on his board, but we worked together. We, you know, he saw how I addressed problems, how I tried to solve problems. And through that board participation, he proposed my name at Glen Mead as a potential board member there. Coincidentally, there was a woman on the Glen Mead board who happened to sit on a foundation board where I also sat. And so it was very natural for her to second my nomination. So I had two points of contact there and without really trying, it all just coalesced and um, I was invited to join the board. Thanks, uh, Howard. Well, my my first board role, you know, came about in a in an odd way. Um, I was a student in grad school. The bookstore sells books, but it sells furniture and clothing, everything else. It, it it's run as a cooperative. Five miles down the road is another university. Its version of the same store. It's one company. Uh, the board was faculty and students. So I stood outside the gym, collected signatures, and got on the board. And we had real problems. We had to replace management because the cooperative rebate was vanishing. We had director misconduct. And I found myself sitting next to a professor of securities regulation from the law school who taught me corporate governance and I barely knew what a corporation was. And I've been serving on boards ever since, but because my day job is turnaround and crisis management, most of my board roles involve situations where something's going on. So if it's a public company, shareholder activism is quite common. And that has destabilized things. If it's a private company, it could be restructuring. On a few occasions, a lender group has gotten fed up with a large customer and has taken the keys. And now they own it, they gotta run it, they need a board. And I go on the board, but my shareholders are banks who keep forgetting they're shareholders, not banks. 
and uh, all they can do is vote me in or out. Um, but our job is to build up the value, work with management, replace it, and then get their money back. Um, on nonprofit boards, you frequently encounter a mentality that treats it a little bit like governance light, that you know, we're here for the good of the public and, and all that, but the rules are the same. The fiduciary duties are identical. The, uh, the nonprofit board I'm on has over 10,000 employees. We physically touch 40,000 people a year. We need governance and we take it very seriously. So because I'm a failure guy by day, I see firsthand mm -hmm where good governance makes a difference. So I really believe in it. Let me, we're talking about nonprofits now. Let me just stick with that for a minute. And uh, for many of you, uh, nonprofits have worked out to be a stepping stone to for-profit boards because of relationships you developed on not-for-profit boards, but all nonprofit boards aren't the same. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rhonda, you want to talk a little about the type of not-for-profit boards that, um, assuming you agree with the mission, uh, which is really the main purpose to go on a nonprofit board, talk about how, uh, what type of not-for-profit boards could position you it, both in terms of building relationships, but in terms of giving you experience to governance experience to go on a for-profit board. And what type of leadership positions should you seek on those not-for-profit boards so people see you in action in a meaningful management and leadership role? So I think time. you're right to draw a distinction between small nonprofits, you know, like uh, that you're little league association or something like that, where you can get, you're doing a good deed and you are definitely providing a service and you're gonna learn something, but it's different than some of the much larger nonprofits. I'm thinking more like educational institutions and um, healthcare institutions. So if you can get on the board of your alma mater or um, a healthcare system, those are going to present you with the same kinds of issues or many of the same kinds of issues that you'll see on a for-profit board. So you'll be dealing with financial issues and audit issues and governance issues. Um, when I, community college, I had to deal with union issues. That was the only time I've ever been in a context with a unionized um, employee base. So I actually had issues there that I never had in a for-profit setting. Um, and and you also, fiduciary duty issues, conflict issues, all of those things come up in your large, sophisticated nonprofits. And, you know, people will see you um, asking questions, analyzing issues, and trying to reach solutions. So I, I think that it's a really good training ground for your um, for profit uh, board service. Especially if you run a committee on a significant mm -hmm. nonprofit board. And uh, actually, that was very indirectly my way onto the Penn Mutual Board. So I ran the education, I was the chair of the education committee at the Academy of Natural Sciences, a member of the board. I was in private practice at Ballard Spar, which is a common denominator <laughs> here. Uh, a, a member of the board was the CEO of Provident National Bank. <coughs> Which was then a subsidiary of PNC. Uh, the, uh, P, the president of Provident National Bank saw me run a committee. Uh, he asked me then to be the general counsel of Provident National Bank. And when I was interested in board service, when I retired and I called him up for advice, he was the one who put me on the Penn Mutual board because he was then the CEO of Penn Mutual. And hope, I assume that Cherie spoke for my character on the Penn Mutual board. <laughs> you assume correctly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go back to, so let me do, I ask a tactical question. Uh, Gail, what are your tips for how to go about building and leveraging your connections to get on a board? We all talked about having connections and leveraging connections, but what do you, know, what do, you do? What do you do if I'm interested in board service five years from now, two years from now, what are your suggestions? Well, uh, other than keeping your friends for a long time and you're building your network, <laughs> Therese, Therese, you and I could be like sisters in this because 
I got on a board because um, it was at my best friend from high school's wedding, okay? Sat next to somebody who was the best friend of the groom, childhood friend, and he happened to be chair of a board and um, they were looking for a new board member. And so that's how that happened. So the, the friendship cl clearly is something, having friends for a long time, but the, I have this philosophy, you know how they, they have this advertising about buying local? Well, I think boarding local is a really good thing because you, um, you know the people in the community. And I think the, one of the best ways to do it is if you're interested in serving on a board is to let your friends know and the people that you know in your network that you are interested in serving. Um, at the same time, you should have a board resume ready that really focuses on what your value proposition is for a board. Now you could have, you know, um, you might modify the resume depending on what the board request is so that it really highlights uh, what that uh, board might need. Uh, but, I, but I do think it's really important to let people know because in your network of friends or people that you've served on nonprofit boards with um, it will generally be how you will get on a board. It's, it's those contexts. And to your point about seeing you in action, especially if you're a lawyer, you know, historically, because I know Sharice and I went on our first boards in 2006. At that time, they didn't want lawyers, even, even though we were in you know, in companies that, that made us okay, acceptable at that point. Um, we weren't in a law firm, but uh, you were at Comcast. And um, at, at that point I was at Harley Davidson. And so I was viewed more from a business perspective. So I think, I think even for lawyers today, even though there are more lawyers today that are, especially women that are put on boards, I do think it's very important to understand what your value proposition is, what you're going to bring to a board. And, you know, some of that entails looking to see who's on the board of the particular company you might be interested in serving on, see what skills they have. Can you fill certain gaps that they, you know, skills that they don't have on the board? Um, all of those things I think are really important. So you have to do your homework about the companies let your friends in your network know that you want to serve on a board, have a board resume that is ready so that, you know, it doesn't take two weeks after somebody says, oh, I have, I have a, a thought about this. You know, I, I know somebody who's looking for a board member. Um, and I think it's also asking advice of your network, you know, um, uh, how they think it would be good for you to go about it. Are there people that you should be talking to um, in their network of people that would be helpful to give you advice. And I, I think all of those things are the way to do it. The great thing about what I would call boarding local is that you really generally understand the culture of the company. Um, so that, because I knew um, a lot of people in the business community in Milwaukee and how I ended up going on boards was because I was serving as chair of the board of the YMCA or chair of the United Way, you know, huge fundraising drive where we raised over $50 million. And I was serving with the CEO of one of the largest banks and the CEO of Manpower. So it was the three of us as the co-chairs of this drive. So, you, you know, you, you develop a network of people that are all serving on boards. And when I was approached about serving on the Badger Meter board, which is a public company, um, I knew everybody on the board, but one person. And I knew them well enough that they didn't even like need to interview me really because they all knew me. They had been on the YMCA board with me. They had done a United Way fundraising campaign. They'd been on the Milwaukee Art Museum, but somehow we all knew each other. So that's why I said, Sharice, we're sort of sisters in this because it's a very similar story. Thanks, Gail, that's terrific. And any other tactical tips? before we move on to something else. Helen, can I just interrupt for one second to give the first CLE code? Um, the first CLE code is cheesesteak and you can find the CLE evaluation form link in the chat box. Thank you. Just as a, you know, as a, a discipline uh, to pick up on what Gail says, if you're interested in this, make a list of the people you know 
who are on boards, who know people who are on boards. It could be your CEO, if you have a close relationship with your CEO in the company, it could be other board members, board members of for-profits and not-for-profits who are on boards. You know, do your research to see who's on boards. Uh, very often outside auditors are very helpful in introducing people to boards. A uh, general counsel who are in the boardroom could be very helpful in submitting your name to the board. And uh, we'll talk about later, there are a lot of databases now that um, may have mixed value, but uh, personal relationships are the critical thing. And again, if, it's, if, if, you, if you really want to do board service in a for-profit company, it's a very disciplined process to uh, tap your network. I agree how important it is to make it known when you're interested in doing it. I mean, I'm in a network where there are emails a couple of times a month saying, oh, I know of a board seat and you know, public company in Ohio that's looking for somebody with financial expertise. Those kinds of emails go around all the time. And if you get on one of those lists, you see whether there's ever a match. And be specific in what you're asking for. Are you asking for advice? Are you asking for an introduction? Uh, and, uh, and then as Gail said, uh, formulate your value proposition before you start using your network to get on a board. What will you bring to a board? Um, Gail, what role do search firms play in your view in getting on a board and how much effort should somebody make to uh, get into the, uh, into the database of a search firm? You're asking me? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's interesting. I, I think search firms today play a more significant role for women. And, and you know, this last six months probably even more so for women of color. Um, I don't think that when Sharice and I first went on boards that they played um, at all, really, uh, because they we were not on the radar, or quite frankly. I mean, so they may have your resume because somebody had sent it in, but I don't think it was a priority at that point. I think that's changed. Um, and, I, and I think it's changed because you have disclosures that are required in public companies on diversity, on, on um, what you're looking for in the board. Those are only getting um, more vocal in the sense that investor groups, whether it's ISS or Glass-Lewis, are looking at this um, and they're going to start voting uh, no, um, uh, for for people on nominating committees, if they don't see diversity on the board, uh, and my understanding is ISS is probably looking at a recommendation for next year that uh, racial and ethnic diversity will be part of their view as well as gender. So I, I think today search firms play a much greater role because boards that are much more homogeneous don't have the networks. In, in many cases to reach out to um, women and, and people of color. So I think that, um, you know, you'll, you'll see, I think search firms tapping um, or requesting, uh, you know, I, I, more women um, to apply or to be selected in, the, in those cases. But, heretofore, it was just not a great, as great a priority. So they were listening to their clients and it wasn't top on the client's uh, list of um, you know, what they were looking for. Yeah, having, having said that, oh, and, and often uh, corporations hire a search firm to look for specific, people in specific, with specific industry expertise, especially for a national board. But I heard the statistics the other day have even with uh, with board being boards focusing more on getting a broader network, uh, search firms still play a role in only um, fifteen percent of board searches. Eighty for eighty five percent come from networks, as we've been hearing today. So that continues to play today. Therese, let's talk about lawyers on boards because. Uh, Gail and you talked about uh, you got on boards despite being a lawyer. Yeah. Uh, talk about what challenges lawyers need to overcome in getting a board seat and 
in actually in successfully serving as a director? Sure. Well, you know, I, 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 you, you have to be very serious about projecting the knowledge that you have about an industry. Um, you cannot go on a board and um, want to be in a position of second guessing the general counsel. A big corporation is going to have plenty of lawyers. So they don't need a lawyer to come on the board to uh, function as, as, as a lawyer. They, they've got legal advisors. Um, and so I think it's, it's a challenge um, in terms of, of how you develop your portfolio and um, how you suggest you can um, uh, you know, add value. Certainly a lawyer is going to have uh, knowledge of corporate governance. And I, I think that that is always um, um, a way that, that lawyers can um, sell themselves and be successful. Um, there, there are also, um, uh, you know, folks that have, say, a labor and employment background. You're going to have bring some value um, on a compensation committee or, or even an audit committee. And so the real question um, for the lawyer is not to try to sell yourself as a, you know, super lawyer, but that you have business skills that are going to be helpful um, to um, both analyze strategy as well as give good advice to managers. So this gets into how do you, how do you formulate your value proposition, which yeah. Kyle talked about? How are you been on lots of boards? Uh, talk to us a little about um, framing your value proposition. If you're a lawyer and you don't want to you don't want being a lawyer to be an obstacle on you getting on a board. Well, so, uh, you know, first of all, the, the percentage of, of directors who have JD degrees is increasing. Um, and that includes, of course, people who are practicing or, or did actively practice. Um, there has been something to overcome because traditionally lawyers were not looked to, but as I say, it increases. And you really want to demonstrate your ability to contribute. You may have, as, as someone said a moment ago, knowledge of an industry through your representation. You certainly understand corporate governance. You may certainly understand risks and particularly risk of litigation. If the company's in a regulated industry, you may have knowledge of that. However, as has also been, been said, it is very important to remember you are not there as a lawyer. You could have a letter from God in your pocket telling you what the right answer is legally. You're not there to give it. So you might suggest, let's ask counsel. You might even say, you know, I think the answer might be, but let's ask counsel. You must always defer because it would be an ethical mistake for you to give legal advice in that situation. Um, and it would be confusing to the others. You also should be aware that there may be undue deference given to you. You are just one other director. You have one vote. You have the right to be notified of meetings, period. So you really want to fight that dynamic that can sometimes show up. Oh, he's the lawyer. He knows or she knows. Um, it, it's not healthy. Um, but we've done programs recently for the American Law Institute and others on lawyers serving on boards. And I will tell you folks, it's a thing. And we really encourage lawyers, both while they're practicing and getting ready after practice to be board ready. Um, we see a question in the chat box, Helen, about people who may want to contact past clients if they've retired. I think that would be a function of their relationship with their law firm, any ethical rules in their jurisdiction. And then, you know, being very gentle about it, you know, don't, don't overdo it, but there may be nothing wrong with it. You'd have to look case by case. Thanks, Howard. Um, any other thoughts on how you frame your value proposition? Yeah, I, I, I think recently given COVID and everything else that's going on, um, one thing that lawyers do well is crisis management. Um, you know, as part of a general counsel job, I mean, you know this, Helen, it's, it, you have them regularly. They, they may not be as all consuming as COVID has been, but, but you have them regularly. And 
I think today there's a greater premium on crisis management. And that's a skill that's very business focused, but yet um, I think the skill that lawyers bring to it is being able to analyze the issues and work through them in a very lawyerly way in an organized way. And um, I think that's a, a great skill. So when people are thinking about you know, framing your value proposition, um, and particularly if you don't have in-house um, uh, jobs or positions, one thing you might think through is, is crisis management as part of that, because I think it is something which a lot of boards now value more, um, having gone through what they've just gone through and the boards have been more active in that. Um, I also think that the changes that we've seen in the Delaware courts recently on increasing board monitoring and oversight, um, that, that will also help, I think, uh, lawyers frame their value add to a board. Um, in a, and in a lawyer, and not in um, uh, speaking over the general counsel or not in taking their role. I think that's really critical what um, Therese and Howard both noted. And I, I learned that from a Penn alum actually, Dick Beatty, who was on the Harley Davidson board. And um, Dick is a really prominent lawyer. He was chairman of a major firm in New York. And the I think some people on the board were used to turning to him and asking him legal questions. And whenever I was in the room, he would immediately say, Gail, what do you think about that? And, he, and it quickly turned their minds around to say, oh yeah, Jen, we'll ask the general counsel. Um, so I, you know, I think that that's really an important observation. Absolutely. Let me, if, if you are in-house or you, you know, you've been in-house or you have been in, um, in a legal capacity or non-legal capacity, uh, or it been otherwise in the business world. Let me just tick off a list that I put together to think about how you frame your value proposition for a board. Um, present your business operational and executive leadership experience. Uh, boards are interested in that. Uh, if you have profit and loss exper experience, if you've run a business and had P&L experience, talk about that in your board resume, in your elevator pitch. Um, if you have international experience, whether you're in-house or in a law firm, it's very desirable for a company that has international operations or, or a foreign company. And there are a lot of opportunities for boards, uh, boards in foreign companies because there are quotas for uh, diversity quotas in a, in a lot of companies. Um, if you have enterprise risk experience, that's something to present in putting your value proposition together. To pick up on what Gail said, enterprise management experience, a related uh, group of skill set is reputation risk management experience. As we've all learned, companies Get, have gotten in trouble in the last few years because of major reputational problems. And boards in, for many companies who have been through those problems are looking for people who have reputation risk experience. Um, obviously relevant board experience, industry experience, financial expertise is something that's always highly coveted, uh, particularly if you qualify as a financial expert. Um, recent hot areas are digital expertise, cyber expertise, sustainability expertise, and then understanding what uh, your company's strategy, strategy is, uh, what, what experience you have that relates to the company's strategy. So um, being on a board is not for everybody uh, for lots of reasons. And uh, at the very least, it requires a time commitment. And depending on the board, the time commitment may be very significant. And as Howard said, as a fiduciary, you have legal responsibilities and risks. So Gail, would you start off on this? Um, what should you ask yourself or what do you ask yourself in considering whether to serve on a corporate board? Time. You know, I, I think time is critical, you, you know, and depending on where you are in your 
life experiences and responsibilities with younger children or children that are out of the household or uh, your job um, and um, what's going on in your company. And in some companies don't permit people to go on boards for that reason. Um, other companies do, but um, my general sense is time is really critical. What I found also is that if you're going back to my uh, uh, comment about local boards, um, a local board is easier in some ways because not only do you know the people in the company, but they're local. You don't have to travel, so you don't lose a day, you know, um, traveling to or from board meetings. Uh, in the days when we used to travel to and from board meetings and we didn't do everything on Zoom. Um, so I think really analyzing the time commitment is, is critical, especially if you're, if you're working. Um, I, you know, the other things I think you need to think about um, are the, you, I think you mentioned it earlier, selectivity. You know, you want to look at the, the strength of the board. You want to look at the strength of the CEO and management of the company. Um, not that there won't be changes over the time you might be serving on the board. But, you know, I think the chemistry on the board is really critical. Um, are they going to listen to people? Does the CEO listen? Is the CEO a good listener? Um, uh, and, and, you know, do you want to be on a board where you have some relationship with the people you like them or you don't like them? Or, you know, I think talking with the CEO and, and making sure that um, you, th you think that they're a person of character, I think is, is really important. And I think it's also, do you have an interest in the subject matter of the company? I mean, uh, if it's something that doesn't interest you, uh, you know, I, I don't know why somebody would want to sit on the board. Um, and there are certain companies that I wouldn't sit on the board because I, I, I wouldn't want to use their product, you know. <laughs> Um, ever. <laughs> and so I think you need to think through all of those things and, and be selective uh, in how you, uh, how you approach it. it. It's not just, do they want me? It's, do I want them? And I think that's a critical element um, that sometimes gets lost on people who are so anxious to get on their first board. Absolutely. Sharice, uh, you were, you're asked to be on boards all the time. Anything that went through your mind in deciding what whether to pursue something or not? Sure. Well, you know, first of all, as, as Gail says, it, first of all, it's time. I mean, do you have the time? And I think a lot of people um, find the, um, you know, thought of being on a, a board as, um, you know, sexy. But it's a lot of work. You need to get <laughs> lots of material. You really have to make sure that you've got time to um, eat and digest the, the material. You have to be prepared. You can't go into uh, the boardroom without being um, uh, prepared. Um, I, I also look at what is the reputation of the company? What is the, what is the product? What is their reputation in the community? What is my understanding about the culture of that company, the right. culture of management? You know, is this a um, you know a company that doesn't have diverse leadership? I mean, I, I'm always interested in looking at who are the leaders of the company. Do they reflect the community? Um, does this uh, board really need my expertise? Um, and what is and also I, and yes, sort of alluded to this. What is the culture of the board? Is this a board where you can really have an impact where people um, are going to uh, be comfortable? And the, the interesting thing, and you know. Helen can um, talk about this. I mean, one of the wonderful things about uh, the Penn Mutual Board is that we, we have dinner with each other. I mean, our board members really get to know each other. We have one uh, uh, dinner a year where our, the spouses are invited. And it's really a nice thing uh, when you can develop those personal relationships. So I, I want to know what is the culture of the company? What is the culture of the board? Uh, and then it, it's really important, do, do I have the time? And, and in terms of, you know, how do you do due diligence? So for a public company, Howard, it's easy to do due diligence, right? You look at, you look at public filings, you can look at the 10K and you look at the 10Qs, recent 10Qs and the proxies. Uh, you could also, for example, uh, look at, to see whether there are any enforcement actions against the company. Uh, and then Google searches are the greatest. I mean, you could find out a lot about a company. Uh, whether it's public or not, whether they've had recent problems or, or not. But um, 
doing your due diligence and figuring out, is this a board you really want to go on? Are these are people you want to spend time with? Are these people who you want to put your reputation potentially at risk with and the management of your reputation at risk? You know, we're, what we have is our reputation and our integrity. And it's not worth going on any board if your integrity is going to be compromised or you're going to ask to be rubber stamp things that you think this are not the right thing to do. So, um, Ellen, I just want to jump in and give the second CLE code, which is pretzel. Um, and please refer to the chat to get the CLE evaluation form if you don't have it yet. Thank you. Uh, so, Helen, I'll comment on what you said um, and also talk about the liability aspect. So, uh, yes, you certainly want to check out the company that you're joining. You want to go in with your eyes wide open, know what's going on. Uh, adding to our discussion earlier about lawyers serving on boards, you if you are currently serving, you have to clear conflicts. So you have to make sure that your firm does not represent you know, certainly not the company, but also are they in litigation with anybody or could they be? You wouldn't want to be representing an opponent of your firm's litigation. That'd be a problem. So uh, you have some, some, you know, due diligence to do. Um, from a liability point of view, we all know, especially you folks, uh, that the national pastime of America is not baseball, it's litigation. <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, you therefore really want to check out the DNO policy. Uh, the way I do it is I have the company send it to me before I join the board. I have it reviewed by a broker, one of the large international brokers that did not write it because they are motivated to find something wrong with it. And I hope they don't. But if they do, I show it to the company and I say, please review this. Unless you can show me why these folks are wrong, I think you got a problem. And I would urge you not to simply tell your incumbent broker to fix the problem. They should have told you, let's give these guys a chance to quote, and then we'll see. And then when you get on the board, figure out what else they're not checking up on from a risk or insurance point of view. Uh, when you join a board, sometimes your most valuable organ is not your brain, it's your nose. Uh, DNO insurance is written on a claims made basis, which means it must be enforced both when the alleged bad act occurred and when the lawsuit is brought, which can be any time within the statute of limitations. Well, what if the company fails? Who's paying the premiums? So you would like to see if a tail can be arranged at the time the policy is written so that if it ever expires for any reason, there is a tail that's in force for the period of the statute of limitations. These are just a few tips. There are others, but I don't want to take too much time. I tell you, in my experience, a corporate board that was um, recruiting me once got terrified when I asked them all these questions about their the indemnifications and the DNO insurance. And I think they said to their so, themselves, "I think I don't really want a lawyer on this board." <laughs> Any, anyway, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> Let me just, uh, we have a lot of questions that I want, we only have 10 minutes left and I want to be able to turn to those questions, but just, Gail, would you talk for a moment about the range of corporate boards that present opportunities for board service? So we talked about not-for-profits, we talked about, uh, we talked about uh, public company boards. Uh, Charisse and I are on a mutual board. Charisse is on a subsidiary board of a public company. Uh, Howard, say a word, literally two minutes of uh, boards that are owned by private equity companies because that's another avenue or, or com startup company, private companies that are about to go public, which is another good place for uh, mm -hmm. lawyers sometimes to go on boards. Yeah, sure. So in thinking about the opportunities that might be open to you, consider the portfolio companies of private equity funds. Um, they have historically underutilized corporate governance. They have typically populated those boards, three from the fund, two from the company. Nobody's independent. Nobody's speaking truth to power. And I encountered this when I was an expert witness in a case where that was exactly the problem, i.e., had there been independence on that board, I'm sure they would have avoided the problem that they had. So 
um, increasingly private equity funds are waking up to this because they recognize that when they're buying a company, it's a plus if that company has a real board. Well, then why don't they dress up their companies to get ready to sell? Because they do sell. They look for exits after a number of years. So that's an opportunity. Another area is emerging companies, tech companies, companies that are trying to make it in the world and historically underutilize their board. The board will just be the founders. And that really doesn't give them the benefit of any expertise or experience, worldliness. So that would be an, an opportunity as well. Uh, thank you. I, I think we're going to pivot for a minute and turn to some of the questions. And then if we have time, we're going to uh, post resources that exist to assist women in obtaining a board seat. There are, as I said, there are a lot of databases and a lot of, uh, a lot of firms that will help women prepare a board resume, an elevator pitch, how to go about leveraging your network in a disciplined way. So if we have time, we'll talk about that at the end. And, but let's turn to some questions. Can I make one last point before you turn to the questions? And that is the responsibility of those of us who do go on boards to, to try to you know, reach down and pull up the next person. Um, I served on a number of nominating committees and that's mm -hmm. a really great way to help build the pool. But um, don't get on a board and then forget about the other people who are trying to get on as well. Great point. Rhonda, let me uh, focus on two questions. And then I do want to end with Howard posting some of the uh, sites that are where you could get access to uh, databases and programs. Uh, one question is about uh, the practice areas that each of us specialized in before joining a board and how, if at all, it impacted on the boards we chose and our value proposition. So uh, Rhonda, let me start with you since you ended the last comment. Um, well, my background is in corporate law at which is very, was very convenient in terms of corporate governance issues and corporate securities, which helped on a public company issues. Um, but I, I actually think that training as a lawyer in any field is going to be helpful. Therese? Yeah, so I was a litigator um, focused on um, uh, labor and employment law. And um, I have served on the compensation committee and I'm chairing the compensation committee now at Penn Mutual. Um, and so I, I think, I agree with Rhonda that I think the legal training is just good because we are approaching problems and, and, and risk, but uh, I was a litigator. And Howard, you didn't practice law. Gail? Yeah, um, hard to say. I, I started as a tax lawyer, but quickly ended up doing major transactions as the tax person on deals, went in-house and uh, was in financial services, was in publishing and media, was in manufacturing consumer product at Harley-Davidson. And I teach a uh, class in strategically managing intellectual property. So I figure I'm like a generalist, <laughs> but I think, um, I think as you indicated, I think really any, any area in the practice of law you know, is helpful. It's more the thought process and it's the perspective you bring to the transaction or to the deal or to the conversation. And I think it is how you frame it when you have that opportunity to speak to somebody about the board that is critical. So if you're in litigation, sort of, you know, what are the larger litigation matters you've handled in what areas for what kind of companies and framing it more from a business perspective like that? Oh, and I'll say a word about bankruptcy attorneys as well, yes. because they're used to working things out. Right. In a bankruptcy, a blow up for anybody's a blow up for everybody. Mm. You want it to work out. And so they're good at achieving consensus. Yeah. Well, it's also a highly desirable skill right now. Yes. Yeah. I was a litigator and healthcare lawyer in private practice, and then I became general counsel of uh, financial services companies. Mm -hmm. so I became a banking lawyer. And but Howard, the better way to frame it is restructure. <laughs> That's, yeah. Howard. 
And, but uh, for me, it was really about uh, the value proposition was about being a business leader mm -hmm. and a strategic leader and uh, not my legal expertise in any way. Well, and, but you were also though in a regulated industry. So yeah. you, I mean, and that, that makes a difference, I think yeah. from a business, you know, business in regulated industry, business in non-regulated particularly with a legal background. I mean, totally. it's very, it is desirable in a regulated industry to have people who right. have had some compliance and, and legal experience. Uh, the, um, another question we had is about, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Is there a certain level of, they're all good questions. Is, it a, is there a certain level of experience before which you would be considered a serious candidate for a board member? Uh, number of years, seniority, general counsel, partner, associate. Uh, Therese? I, I mean, I think it's, you know, you're talking 15, 20 years. Um, all of the boards that, that I'm on tend to skew older. And um, one of the things that we're all talking about is, is trying to bring in some, some younger blood. Um, but, you know, I think 15 or 20 years experience, which means if you're early on in your career, I think you have time to really start to develop some of these, uh, these skills that will, will make you board ready. I would encourage people to start as early as they feel the interest. A lot of companies want the input of millennials. They want to know how younger people are thinking. You know, you are what you are. You're not what you're not. But put it out there. I think you'll find receptiveness. I think a lot of consumer companies, uh, tech companies, apps, you know, gaming companies, um, you know, obviously want to have younger people uh, who are, grew up with this. I mean, it's, you know, I think that's a, an important skill. And um, so I think in those circumstances, they may skew younger than even the 15 year, depending on what the company's looking for, particularly a startup. Startups, IT companies, communication services companies, mm -hmm. smaller companies. Uh, there's a statistic I have that uh, this is for public companies in the S&P 500 and Russell 3000, that uh, the average age of board members are people in their 60s. So if you're younger, that's not where to target, except there are exceptions in some industries, but uh, in there. Yes, right. Um, let me, Howard, let's just put up and, and very briefly, because we are out of time, uh, put up your slides, if you would, on uh, Laura, Laura is doing it. Is that what you wanted, Helen? Yeah, this is, these are just organizations on, uh, that you may look at if you want to get on a database, uh, get involved with education programs, uh, learn in some instances how to prepare a board resume and how to focus on a value proposition for yourself. These organizations, some have courses, some have um, admission requirements to get in, uh, but there are a lot of resources now that are available. Howard's just going to put up a few of these. Yeah, Laura, you're you're controlling them. So, women yeah. in the boardroom. The slide that's right up there right now is a New York-based group. I do monthly webinars for them. I actually did one today on nominating and governance committee best practices. But they provide coaching, um, assistance, putting together a board bio, helping you with your elevator speech, helping you with structured networking. Believe it or not. And um, they've been successful. They're one of the few groups that purports to help people get on boards that is willing to quote their success rate, how many of their people have gotten there. So, and they also get inquiries because boards that are looking to add diverse people don't know where to find them. And this is one of the places they go. So I recommend this group. And then uh, quickly, Laura, if you put up the- Howard, it's a membership. You'd have to join it. Right. It is, yeah. it is, it is, it is. There's a cost. Mm -hmm. But I see a lot of people reing up, so they must be happy with it. Mm -hmm. um, Laura, if you'd put up the National Association of Corporate Directors slide, NACD. Uh, 
Yeah, so this group um, has over 21,000 members, chapters in major cities. To be a member, you have to be on a board, but a nonprofit is sufficient. You can go to two meetings without being a member, and then you got to join if you can. Companies can join as full board members, which means the whole board becomes a member automatically and it's cheaper. And it's a terrific group. They have a certification and fellowship credentials that public companies put on their proxies. I'm on their national faculty. I can attest to its value. They have a director registry that lists the members who are seeking board roles and their qualifications. Thank you, Howard. Thank you, Howard, is that since we have an audience of lawyers, um, a lot of times they're looking for experts to speak on panels. And so that may be a way that you could get exposure as well. Absolutely. Right. right. There are a lot of databases now uh, for, in addition to what Howard said, for diverse candidates to postpone, to post their interest in joining boards and in turn for boards to find diverse candidates. And let me just give you some names quickly. Boardspan, which also has a helpful toolkit, Equilar Diversity Network, Boardlist, and Catalyst. And um, California, which again, continues to be on the leading edge, uh, the state treasurer has set up a database for women interested in serving on corporate boards in California. And, Cal and as I said, there's a good opportunity in California because of uh, quotas. And direct women, which uh, well, there's a slide up here someplace, uh, they are focused on increasing representation of women lawyers on corporate boards. And uh, the Institute helps women lawyers, as you can see, prepare for board service. And uh, there are working sessions to help participants develop their value proposition, uh, personal board search strategies. You also hear from and meet with recruiters. And, but if you uh, Google databases for board positions, uh, more and more of these are coming online and serving as resources uh, both for you as potential candidates and as significantly for board, boards and nominating co governance committee who are looking for diverse candidates. In almost every major city, there's some organizations, some of them are female um, uh, focused only, um, but that have databases. So Milwaukee, it's Milwaukee Women Inc. In Chicago, the Kellogg School, has a database um, in Washington. There's some, uh, you know, another school that has a database. So you can also find it in your local area. Um, and that's something that would be good, particularly if, you're, um, if you have a strong network in that city. Uh, excellent. Uh, just to go through uh, briefly some additional questions. Um, Howard, you have experience in this. Tips for considering a board role in a startup company. Well, so, uh, you know, typically there's not going to be cash compensation. It may be in equity or equity equivalent. So you want to think about whether you believe in it because you're banking on its success. Um, you know, frequently they're operating on a bit of a shoestring. So you want to make sure all risks are being adequately looked after depending on the business they're in. And of course, the DNO insurance is important, including that tail I mentioned. Um, but you also want to think about what do you bring? I mean, can you, do you think you can make a valuable contribution? Hopefully you can, but ask yourself that question. Right. Uh, we have a few questions about, you know, how do you prepare a board resume uh, that's different from a resume you would prepare looking for a job in a law firm? Uh, it really re relates to uh, some of the things we talked about on your value proposition. I mean, you talk about if you have board service, if you've had uh, management experience, business experience. Uh, Charisse, you want to pick up and give some other thoughts? And as I said, some of these tools give you, uh, uh, public tools give you good guidance on how to prepare a board resume. Yeah, sure. It's, it's really what we talked about in terms of the value proposition. What are the things that are going to make you appropriate for this company? What is your knowledge of the industry? Have you had P&L responsibility? It, it has to be brief. Um, you talk about your education and the various roles and responsibilities that you've had 
um, in terms of, uh, of, of running a company or being involved in um, as, a, as a legal advisor to a particular uh, company. Yeah. Right. I think you generally want to lead with your business experience. Even yeah. if you're a lawyer, it's the area of expertise and what you bring. So it would be, if I were doing one right now, I'd be, you know, um, intellectual property because that's a big deal for a lot of companies. It's a huge asset for most of them. Um, it would be business leadership roles that you've had. Uh, even in managing a firm, if you're the you know global chair or you're you know the managing partner of a, those things are important because they're they're demonstrating your management capability and experience. That, so I'd lead with that and then get into what you did as a lawyer. But it's more about what skills and experience you've had and focusing on those, and you know making sure that that's something that that board would need. Great. And, and Sharice, let me just uh, ask you a, a last question that somebody posed. Sharice, uh, for those of you who uh, do not know, was the city's solicitor of Philadelphia. I can't stop my phone from ringing. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is a question posed about uh, if you're considering government service, mm -hmm. uh, what should you be thinking about uh, before joining a board? You know, potential conflicts of interest or other things that uh, somebody who's interested in government service should be aware of. So if, if this is somebody who's, who is thinking about going on a board after having been in government or before they go in government? Un or, or they're in government. They're it's in unclear. Government. It looks like somebody who wants to go into government one day. Wants to go in government. Because one of the things about if you're talking government. about going in, in, into government uh, and, and going on a board, um, you know, there are going to be, um, you know, there, everything that you do is directly going to have an impact on, on your future. And so I think you have to be careful about uh, what boards you're, uh, you're, you're going on. Um, and so this just gets, once again, in terms of your trying to figure out how you select what it is that you bring to that board. Um, I don't think that there are many board opportunities that you're going to have that is going that will preclude you from going into government. Um, but you know, you do want to make sure that you're, um, you know, it's an it's an industry that you're dealing with people that um, have high integrity um, and um, are good business people, basically. It may work the other way around that if you've been in government, you may be precluded from going on a board in that industry for a certain period of time. Depending yeah. on what branch. Yeah, there may be some ethical considerations, and then you just have to really understand, and that's going to be a matter of state law. Sometimes it's federal law, depending on, on what where you've been in, in government. Right. And a lot of boards do like people who have been in government, depending on yeah. what department they've been in. Um, that's something. So even though there may be a period of time that you can't go on that board, uh, it may be a real plus um, that you're bringing to the board. That's right. That's right. That's where you yeah. maintain those relationships. So yeah, exactly. if you've got those restrictions, then you figure out a way to yeah. maintain those relationships so that when they, uh, when they, when your time is up, you're the first person they think of. Exactly. So Come full circle, Sharice. Right. So if you take <laughs> any, so if you take anything away from today, it's about networking, 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 relationships, yeah. relationships, relationships. Yeah. And. Uh, if any of you have any questions, you could find us on LinkedIn or Laura could find us. And I just want to end a shout out to my daughter, Julia Pudlin, who may still be on this call, whose birthday is today. Oh, oh happy yeah. birthday, Julia. Happy birthday, Julia. <laughs> and whose baby pictures are behind me, who is a Penn <laughs> Law graduate and has already started her board journey on a not-for-profit board. Awesome. Right. Helen, uh, I put my email address in the chat box if anybody who's attending would like to contact me. Terrific. You put well, us to shame, Howard. We'll all do it. <laughs> so good. He's so good. Well, thank you to all of the panelists. Thank you to Helen for moderating this wonderful discussion. Thank you to everyone for being here today. Um, we will be distributing slides and we're happy to give contact information for the panelists too if you have follow-up questions. I put my email in the chat too, if anybody has any 
follow-up. And as a final reminder, the passcodes for today are cheesesteak and pretzel. Please make sure that those go on your CLE evaluation form. What, what was the first one? Cheesesteak. Oh, cheese. We went, we went Philly themed today. That's good. <laughs> all right. Well, this concludes our program. Thank you all to everybody. Enjoy the rest of your day. Mm -hmm.